Hey everybody, Brian here, uh, back with the games I finished in, this is April 2020? Yeah, we're almost at the end of April. Uh, I was going to hold off on until actually the end of May or something, uh, but I finished quite a few uh, this month and I wanted to uh, get this these while well, they're kind of fresh in my memory and talk a little bit about them. So we'll start off with uh, this right here. Kirby 64. Uh, so I've this is I, I've played a lot of the Kirby games. Um, not a lot of the spin-offs. I think I haven't played like Block Ball or Ball or Star Stacker. But I played like most of the Kirby games. And I've never played Kirby 64. This copy is kind of beat up. Uh, if you see the sticker is kind of tore. Uh, this is a very fun game. It's slow paced, but that's uh, uh, much like uh, Kirby's Dream Land 3 is kind of slow paced. Uh, but it has like an ability where um, you can mix and match abilities. So say you suck up an enemy who's uh, like a spinning sickle and you suck up another enemy that's fire. You'll do like a special, I forget what that one is, but it'll mix match like fire and sword or fire and sickle or ice. And you can mix match different uh, powers. And that was pretty cool to figure out what which one is what they all do, find out what they look like. It's a very short game, it's not too long. There's, I think, five worlds with about two, three, four, five or six stages each. Um, uh, I think, uh, who's the girl in it that you're helping, say, get the crystal shards back? Um, Adeline, I think it is. She's like a painter. Um, so it's it, it's it's uh, all polygonal uh, like a 2.5D kind of thing uh, look to it. Uh, it looks very clean and crisp. Uh, it's a late Nintendo 64 release. Uh, it's on the, I think, the Kirby Classics 30th Anniversary Collection. I think it was on the Virtual Console on Wii or Wii U, or maybe both. And I don't know if it's anywhere else other than those three places. The cartridge is kind of expensive now. I think it goes for like 30 or $40, just loose. So I, I think you could probably get it on the, uh, um, well, not the Wii Virtual Console anymore, but it might be on Wii U, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it's pretty fun. And I just found out that Kirby 64, Kirby's Dream Land 3, and Kirby's Dream Land 2 were all done by the same developer. Uh, and they have a similar feel to it. They, the blast boss is the same, which I, I didn't even realize. Um, a lot of times when I play these games, like I'm so caught up in the moment. Oh my god, it's the final boss. I don't really take it in. Uh, but yeah, that, that was kind of cool. So yeah, this one was not done by Sakurai. Uh, I think he stopped doing the games uh, a while um, before this. Uh, a few games before this, but yeah, it's pretty fun. Uh, not a long playthrough, a few hours, you know, and nothing too challenging. I did die some, so there is some challenge to it. It's not too brain dead. It's just too short. It's long enough, and it looks really nice. Sounds good too, obviously. Uh, this is another N64 game I've had for a while and never played. That's Conker's Bad Fur Day, and I was expecting this to be like Banjo Kazooie, and it's not really like Banjo Kazooie or Mario 64. It's it's is in the fact that it's like 3D. But it's more of a linear, um, story-based beat theme kind of like beat by beat kind of like platformer. Uh, there's not a lot of stuff to collect. It's mo basically you find out how you need to get to the next level, or next area of the world, and that could be either you go on these little idea platforms, and Conker has like a light bulb above his head, and it, he does this special thing to advance the. the to the next part of the game, uh, so in that it's very linear in that respect. Uh, it's cool to see what he can do. Like, uh, he, like the first one to open up, you, you get like a frying pan, and you have to hit this gargoyle off the bridge that's blocking your way. And Conker straight up kills people in this game. It's it's very uh, the humor is kind of like comes off as kiddish because uh, he like there's like adult humor in it but also like poop jokes which I find still kind of find funny like there's a the, everybody like the great giant poo he's this uh, uh, big piece of poo who's in the like this sewer area and you have to throw toilet paper in his mouth and there's like corn 
all around. You have to throw like corn in the in the sewer pit, and then he comes out and he starts singing. The song's pretty cool. Um, there's like a whole shooting area, like Saving Private Ryan. Ryan. Uh, the controls are kind of weird. Uh, uh, um, so I say m this game is mostly like for the set pieces. It's not a particular. I I don't think it's a, a great game, but it, it's fun to play through. Um, maybe it overstays its welcome a little bit. Um, the last boss is kind of cool. It kind of like in the end, it's kind of neat. The last boss how they handle like that. That I kind of don't want to spoil that. Um, what else? There, there's a part where there's this bull that charges after you, and have to you have to release this cow, and you have to like charge the bull into the cow, and it explodes the cow, and like yeah, it, it's kind of violent. I was surprised the violence in this game and the like crude humor in it. Um, I I still like uh, I don't know if I I'm just too old for it, or I still found some of it funny, but it wouldn't have hit as hard with me as what as it did back then, um, uh, but it was still enjoyable. And I think it's on a remake for the 360 and the Xbox One, you can get it on the Xbox Store, um, live and reloaded, but they did censor that version, I think, so they took a lot of, the, like, the swearing in this, like, they'll straight up swear in that in Conquer for N64, but in the remake, I think they bleep it out. So, if you expect, like, Bandit Hope, Kazooie, lots of collectibles, open world, it's not that. It's mostly going from one place to the other and, like, finding out, like, how to open the area, which was the challenging part, and then seeing the set pieces. There's, like, a Matrix world. It's kind of it's kind of neat. Uh, for the Sega Master System, I... This is a game I really, really loved, uh, Govelius. I started this game, and I didn't know quite how to progress, and then I, I read... I read a little bit. I do have the instruction manual, so that helped to get up a lot. A lot of these early games, like, you want to read the manual first, so it explains to you about uh, well, basically a story, and it, there's a password feature to save, and it explains the different kinds of gameplay. There's like a top-down gameplay, which you start the game in a side view, and you can't scroll back, so once you move forward, you have to keep going forward. Um, and then once you do that, you go into a top-down, view, and that is like your main map screen, like Legend of Zelda or an adventure game, top-down adventure game. And in these screens you have, there's usually a secret in one, every one of the screens, and you open it by hitting your sword on a certain item, and it'll open a cave you can go into. Or you kill all the enemies and it'll open, much like Zelda. Once you figure out there's a hidden secret on each area, the game becomes very addictive, almost like Zelda and the fact that you know there's a brush you can burn or something to bomb in each screen. In these caves, there's a wise woman who will give you like items and stuff. There's a fairy who will tell you usually useless knowledge. She's right here. Um, sometimes it's it's a story progression thing, but most of the time it's just useless stuff. Annie, this other fairy who will restore your life. There's Randar who you pay him and he'll restore your life. Dina who will take if you need gold. She'll take some of your life away temporarily for gold. And Winkle, who's like, uh, she can give you a password, basically, the person you go to, and she gives you the password, um, and then you can restore it to save save your game, basically, and restart. It gives you, like, all the items, which is very important to know, because there's no description in the game, a lot of these older games. Um, uh, and you, you have to increase your health with what um, life potions... Um, I think that's what it does on the... Yeah, and then Bibles increase the amount of gold you get. Uh, there's like three different types of swords. They show the enemies here. I should actually flip it around. And basically how it is, is you have to go into... The, the game is structured, and the, there's a big overworld map of it's gated off until you beat the boss. And there's four of, there's four of them, I think. No, yeah, two, three, four of them. Four or five, I forget. Two, three, I think four. Um, basically, you have to beat the boss and get a crystal. And once you get that crystal, you have to find the right lady in the right. Remember where the like cave is with the lady, and she'll get give the take the crystal, and you'll be able to go into the next area. And then you do the same thing. The challenge in the game is it starts off very simple. The areas are smaller, 
and you find the tips to do, go and where to where to uh, go and stuff. And then it gets very bigger. Like the map map gets much bigger, uh, so it gets much more complicated. But there's always the same uh, thing about there's a hidden area in each stage. And once you do that, it's really fun. Uh, I really enjoyed that loop of going to a new area and scouring around for the hidden uh, cave and then going in. Most of the time, you know, it's when you do find like a Bible to increase your gold and um, like a new health potion to increase your life, it's very, very rewarding. And then when you find, you have to, um, sometimes you have to really scour around for hints of where to go and um, the right place to go. And um, I didn't get stuck too much. I did have to look up one or two things near the end of the game. But other than that, it was very much well balanced. Uh, nothing, not a long game. I think I beat it in a few days, uh, maybe 10, 12 hours or something like that. No, it was more than 10 hours because I take longer to beat games, probably around 15 hours or so, 15, 20 hours. Uh, keeps going, my time keeps going up. But uh, another thing is there's no XP. Most of your XP, if you so you don't gain levels. The way you get stronger is you get life potions by finding them to increase your life bar. Um, and you need gold to buy everything in the game. So it's, it incentives you to beat enemies to get gold. And once you... So everything you have to... Like, even when you get beat the boss to get the crystals, you have to have enough gold to uh, sell them. I, I think you need gold to actually give the crystal away, if I'm recalling. Or something like that. Maybe I could be mistaken, but you need gold for everything. So... To buy potions to increase your life, you need gold. To get Bibles to, to increase your gold, you need gold. So it's constantly a loop of beating enemies to get... Exp I almost think of the gold as experience. Um, so here's some of the bosses here. You fight, I think, this guy's the first one, second, third, and then I think Frostbus is another one. Um, Could be these ones, or I forget, but I think these are the bosses, main bosses here. Yeah, the demons. They are minions of Golvelius, each strong and fierce. Only by defeating them will you be able to get the seven crystals from the wise women. So yeah, um, the, the whole story is there's a, once was a peaceful area uh, world, and then people went to this valley called Govelius to get water, uh, but then demons started acting up in that area, so it became area very dangerous to go to Govelius. They called it the Valley of Doom. So you have to go out, and the princess is kidnapped by Govelius, and you have to go and save her. So you have to venture into the Valley of Doom. Very fun game. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and very addictive. Uh, really, really fun. I haven't beat many Master System games, so this one's on the top of my list so far, because it's the only one I ever beat for the Master System. Um, very good graphics. Uh, there is like a, oh, there's another mode here, if you can see here. It's like a vertical shooter mode when you go into some caves. And at the end is like a quick boss. But if you ever get crushed against the screen, you get exited out. And then you got to redo the whole thing. So you got to memorize like where to go. And it's not too complicated. Um, but you got to keep an eye on your health and such. Um, it, it's a very fun game. I enjoyed it a lot. I like these type of games. Uh, next up for the PlayStation, uh, we have Medieval. This was a... What year did this come out? 1998, so it's a lot later than I thought. But it's still... Um, it's a 3D adventure game. Um, you play as this guy, Daniel Fortecue, I think his name is. And he was like hyped up as the guy who beat the main magician that escaped. Um, but he didn't really. He got killed in like the first battle against them. And he at the so at the beginning of the game you get revived in a crypt. Then your eye is gone. You're like a skeleton, and you have to like beat enemies to get enough to get enough like courage to get a golden chalice. And you take the chalice at the end of the stage, and you can go to this hall of heroes. And the thing is, you got to do that enough times to get accepted in there. And each when you get so many, you talk to a statue. There's like the seven or eight statues in there of heroes that fought with you and they'll give you like upgrades like more life 
uh, that not the different weapon because you start with a sword, you get a better sword, you get an axe, you get like a spear, you get uh, multiple bow and arrows. For um, it's very hard to aim because there is a lock on. It's very finicky. You hit like the shoulder buttons, the L button, and it'll like lock on. But there's like this little spinning fairy that it shows you what's locked on, and it's very hard to see. Um, and the combat, there's no lock on for your normal combat, so and the camera's not the best, so you're constantly swinging. It feels kind of janky. Um, it's not the best game. I, I enjoyed it enough, but I don't think I'll replay it anytime soon. It's very early 3D. I was surprised that it came out so late because it feels like it's earlier than that. Um, because I don't know if this was before, like, other 3D adventure games, like Ocarina of Time with lock-ons. It, it might have been after. I think in 98, so it was probably after, but, uh, it might have been developed before that, but, uh, some kind of better camera movement and, um, uh, control and better feeling combat would be better. Um, it looks very cool. I think it, the look of it, even though it's early 3D, it looks it has a cool look for, to it, and it sounds really good. The music's excellent. Not too long of a game. Uh, it took me about 12, 15 hours, something like that. Um, I'm just guessing. Um, it is DualShock compatible, but that runs into problems where you can play it with the normal DualShock. I'll get my camera to focus here. You can play it with the normal DualShock, or the normal controller and when you play with a normal controller you just use obviously the directional pad and you have to hit a button to run when you play with the dual shock it's move the button forward as far as you move it it'll go faster like if you if you slam it on the right it'll he'll move faster and that got me into some problems where i hit it too far to the right and i fall off cliffs um you have potions and you can get more potions so potions like a full life bar and when you when you die it'll take away one of the potions and you have like a life bar when that's done it counts as a potion um it's pretty fun um it's nothing great but i enjoyed it and there is a remake for it uh for the playstation 2 or not i'm sorry the playstation 4 that came out uh, last year or this year one of the two uh, these next games I'm talking about are games that I've had for a long, long time, and I finally beat them from save files I've had over 20 years old. So these are games I beat, RPGs, that I was 60-some hours in, or 40, 50 hours in, um, and I didn't want to restart, but I didn't want to, I wanted to finally beat them and put them away, and uh, these are some of the earliest games I had for the PlayStation. Uh, the first one is Breath of Fire 3. I only have the disc because I stupidly got rid of all the case art and stuff. Um, this game, I remember really loving it, and I just stopped, and I forgot where I was at. Um, and I, op I hooked up my PlayStation because I wanted to play another RPG. I finished Breath of Fire 2 this year, and I, wanted to, I remember Breath of Fire 3, and I loved the art style and the sound of it. I think it's one of the most beautiful games I remember. Um, one of the, I, I got this early PlayStation game when I got my PlayStation after another game we'll talk about. Um, but I was real far in the game. I didn't know how far. I was just in the middle of a dungeon. So I kind of looked up on YouTube where I was at, and it was right the last like, last dungeon of the game. So I figured, yeah, well, that, won't, that won't be too hard. I'll just... I, I got used to like the menus, the control, this dragon-changing fusion system, and I fell in love with it again. Um, this game's amazing. It, it's, it looks better than a lot of PlayStation games because the artwork is pixel-based. It holds up incredibly well. It sounds amazing. The soundtrack's very unique and funky. Um, the dragon system where you can mix like gems and change into dragons is very cool. Um, there, it's like a fusion system. Um, I kind of looked up which one was best against the last boss because I, I forgot. You know, it's, I last played this game in 1990-something. 20 some years ago and I forgot where I was and I was like 50 60 hours in so I did look up where to go to beat it but uh, I was right near the end and I did beat it um, very satisfying the characters are really cool very well animated in battle the graphics are amazing like I said and the soundtrack is just very very good um, I haven't beat a lot of PlayStation games because um, I'm still going through actually as you see the ones I had so out of the ones I beat, this is hard to say. Uh, I think this is the so far the best 
best RPG I've played on the PlayStation, just from my memories and just from that little bit of remembering and playing. Um, it's fantastic. Can't say good enough things about it. So, the next one is uh, Final Fantasy VII. Uh, this is not my original copy. I think I traded mine in or something because when I went to play... No, what it was... I don't remember what it was. I lent it out to a friend um, when I moved down here, and he never gave it back to me. And I think he lost it or something. I, I don't know. That's why one of the reasons I have, well, I have a few stories where I lent games out and had bad experiences with it, and um, that's why I don't lend games out anymore. Um, but this is not my original copy. I picked this up at a half price books. Let's see. Uh, do I have the receipt? Picked this up at a half price books uh, June 2013, 7:40 p.m. for ten bucks. So I've had this for a while, and my I had much like Breath of Fire 3, I still had my original save on my original PlayStation memory card, and I was 72 hours in on this, and I was at the North Cave, the final area of the game. So I was very close to beating this too, and I just stopped. And I think why I stopped this, 1998 was a weird time for me. I was going to college, and I was so concerned about grades and what I do for my life that gaming fell to the wayside. So, and then since I didn't bring my systems with me to college, I left them at home. I could only play them when I came home for breaks or whatever. So I never really put a lot of time into finishing it. I put, obviously, 72 hours into it, but uh, I never actually finished it. And then time went on. Weeks went to months. I graduated, got a job. Things, you know, early twenties. Then, in 1998, I was uh, 19 when I would have played this. 18 or 19, um, and just it was a weird time. You know, you don't, I, you know, when you're that age, you, you don't know what you want to do. I was worried about what I do for like money and stuff as a job because I, I thought I had to get. Well, this is had to get job. You know, to, you know, make a living. Um, and, uh, I was not living at home at the time. I was at school and in a dormitory and I didn't have games. So I play when I get home. So I got put a lot of time into it. So it's very nostalgic. One of the few games I actually played during that time, that Breath of Fire 3 and the other game. And then, um, Donkey Kong 64 and some uh, N64 stuff. Um, so I wasn't playing a lot of games then, but I do remember a lot some bits and pieces of Final Fantasy VII, and the music when I turned it on it was very memorable to me. I didn't remember the story at all, much of anything. I remember loving the first area, Midgar, and kind of disappointed after that in the game, especially when I got to like the mini-games. I thought those were dumb. I hated them. Um, I thought the game lost a lot of traction after Midgar, kind of like endlessly. The story was kind of, didn't make any sense to me, I remember. But I do remember being stuck at the North Cave and be, not being able to progress further um, and dying to these enemies that would kill me a lot. Um, turns out I just had to put in maybe... Uh, when I started to back up my save, I had to research where I was. I messed around with the materia system to see, okay, this is what I want to do. This is how that works. What all the buttons do, obviously. And I played around, you know, went to some different areas and heard just... It went to the airship and heard the music, got nostalgic from that, and went and fought Sephiroth. Because um, I was really, really close. It's kind of cool near the end, you can split your party up, almost like Final Fantasy VI in Kafka's Tower, but you don't play. I was kind of disappointed when you don't play their parts. They just go off and you play as Cloud's team, and you don't see them getting their, having their adventure, but they meet up with you and they characters you split up with will bring you the treasure that they found so you get all the treasure that way but I was kind of disappointed I wanted to play as those characters going through that part but in the way I was kind of happy because I didn't have to learn like their combat and I remember like the only guys I really really liked in this game were the main characters all the other ones like Vincent I didn't like I didn't like the cat suit guy cat Sith. I didn't like Yuffie, um, so I was glad I didn't. Kind of glad I didn't play as them, but I kind of was disappointed. I could see in the fact that when I 
but it was kind of disappointing. It would have been disappointing to me um, if I did like them. Like I would have wanted to play as them in dungeon, like Final Fantasy VI. But uh, I beat Kafka, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Sephiroth. Um, I looked up some tack tips to beat him because you know it's been a while since I played. I forgot what all the spells were. And you had to cast, like, um, the barrier to break this barrier. And then from there, I just did summons, which took, like, I think 30 seconds to summon. And that's the one thing I don't like about this game. The summons are a little crazy. You're, like, watching them over and over again. Um, yeah, it gets kind of ridiculous. Um, the music's outstanding. I think it's one of the better... It's a great soundtrack. Um, all the Final Fantasies I, that I've played, I've, I've loved the soundtrack. Um, the graphics have a charm to them. Um, it's kind of weird. I, I forgot you can get lost a lot of the ways because it's like almost like you're the character on top of like a JPEG and you have to hit the start button to say, okay, where do I go? And it puts like a big red arrow of where you're supposed to go so you know where to navigate. So it's kind of weird trying to find out where to go. Um, and it switches to battles. And the th 3D models are very primitive, but they're, they're kind of nice and clean and it kind of looks cool. The battle system is fast enough. Um, um, battle theme's great. Uh, but yeah, I beat it, um, and when I was finally on Sephiroth, it goes into, like, this part where you and him fight, like, one-on-one -on -one when you beat him, and, um, you have to use, like, your limit, your time comes up to attack, and you have, like, option, excuse me, you have options, and I think once to attack, and once to your, your get a full limit break, and a limit break is, like, your special attack, and, I was waiting too long and I didn't get to use the limit break, but so Sephiroth attacked me and I thought, oh crap. But and then I attacked him and it killed him like instantly. So that was kind of anticlimactic, but I was like, oh, okay, well, what's, you know, what's next? And then um, that was the end of the game. And then I watched the ending and there was something with um, a meteor coming down. And then I think Ares, which is the girl at the beginning that you're with, and she dies. She's like cast life the spell I think holy because I researched this afterwards because I was like what the heck's going on, um and her casting that spell helps propel meteor and save the planet, um and that shot of her like at the end is like a, almost like from my research the like at the beginning of the game you meet her and there's the same shot of her, and then at the end it's the same shot of her so it's almost like she was supposed to die to save you so that's kind of cool um and then the ending and then it goes to like 500 years later and it shows red oh yeah like i did like red 13 i remember playing as him it's like a dog and then it shows him as his kids um and yeah it was cool um so i'm glad i finally beat final fantasy 7 um i i like the first disc like i said a lot more than the whole other rest of the game i think the mini games are stupid i don't like playing them i remember those even though i didn't play them again um, the music's fantastic. Uh, I think um, the battle system's cool. I didn't like the story. Um, I can't really complain. I can't really say. From what I remember, I don't like the story because it's 22 years or some ago I, yeah, since I played it. So I remember not liking the story. So if I played it again in the future, maybe I'd like it. Um, but at the time, I remember being disappointed that it wasn't, like, sprite-based. I mean, it was cool at the time to see, like, all these cool cinematic pieces, but it felt like they were showing off a little bit more. I thought it was cool, but I thought it was kind of, like, too, mu too much, almost. Um, I kind of missed the earlier Final Fantasies in that regard, but it was still a fun game to beat, and I'm so glad I finally beat it. Next up. Another one I finally beat of an early PlayStation game from another save file I had. Uh, this was the first uh, PlayStation game I ever bought and played. Not the one I ever played. I think the first one I ever played was... Oh, maybe, maybe this was the first one I ever played. That's Wild Arms, another RPG. It came out before Final Fantasy. And I was quite about two-thirds of the way through this game as well. I was at a point where the main character, Rudy... Um, cuts his arm off to save you, and because the main bad guy like grabs your arm, so you cut your arm off, and you find out that you're like a machine. 
and you have to go and he becomes sick and he's like obviously his arms cut off so you have to save him so I was like, pretty far along I rescued him I found out a little bit about the story more where I was and decided to put about mm, 20 more hours in to beat it so my playtime was like 60 some hours afterwards um, but actually it was more like 20 some years plus 60 hours but um, this game, I love the look of it, and the sound of it is amazing, much like Breath of Fire. The world looks beautiful, the world map, um, and, the, and it's very pixel art and very nice. It sounds like a Wild West movie, because it is based on the Wild West, but basically, like, there's this world that's, like, in decay because of this war that happened between um, these beings, and it's like there's deserts encroaching area, areas, and it's very, like, Wild West and primitive now. But the name Wild Arms comes from these arms that people have. They're like guns. And your Rudy is the person who can use these arms. And then you, you're paired with two other characters, Cecilia, a mage, and she can use magic. And uh, Jack, who's a... You find out later, he's the, in the... If you let the story run into the beginning of the game, there's a, a part in the... Like a, uh, down, like a movie at the beginning where he's with her. He was a knight of this kingdom. And she... When the bad guys attacked, he let, he got forced out by the person he loved or another knight, a girl. And then she like shut the gate on him and told him to get help. And then he he's like this treasure hunter afterwards. Um, so the story from what I researched afterwards, and I remember not much about it, but from what I researched and read an instruction, I don't have or an, I looked at a PDF in the instruction manual how to play it. Um, it was kind of interesting. Um, the battle system looks very, very early 3D, so I didn't like the look of it at, at all. Um, yeah, it was like Final Fantasy VII, but it was like very much cruder than that. Um, but it played fine. Uh, but it was typical turn base where you, after every turn, you get like a meter that would go up, and you met, you can do more moves, special moves, as that meter gets higher. You had like summons with these ruins where there's quite a few of them. There's like 20 of them that like summon like in Final Fantasy beings that come down and help you and they do different things. And they also equip your, raise your stats. Um, and you had like different, almost like um, if you're familiar with, uh, what's that? Golden Sun. Very puzzly dungeons, which are kind of cool. Nothing too complicated. I did get... I remember on one of them, um, one of the late game ones, uh, and you have like each enemy, each character has tools, like Rudy can use bombs, and he can like do a scan, it scans and it'll ding when there's treasure around. Jack has like his pet hamster that you can throw out to hit switches and stuff, and he has other ones, and then Cecilia has like this tier that can uh, interact with areas and go into like paintings, not paintings, but other tier areas and go into like a dark world almost. And she has some other th things too I'm forgetting about. It's very fun, and I'm glad I finally beat it. Um, so I think my time on this was like 60, 50 some hours um, total. 22 years, 50 hours, something like that. Not too long, not too long. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, not too long. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm finally happy to beat my PlayStation games that I had for 20-some years. Uh, or saves, anyway. I've had Wild Arms and Breath of Fire 3 for 20-some years. This copy of Final Fantasy I got in 2013. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to finally beat those ones that I've, ha I've had on mem saves of for 20-some years. Mm, PlayStation, this one. I played through Parasite Eve. I remember my friend having this game, and I saw some of it, and the intro was like at an opera, and like everybody bursts in flames, and I found this at a store, do I have the receipt? I remember I found this at a half price books too, for like 5 or $10, or something like that, um, and I've heard high things about it, I had no idea other than just the recollection of what my friend had, when I saw my friend play, um, so it's... Uh, very cinematic looking game. It's an RPG. You have, um, you play as, uh, I think her name is, what is her name? I forget. I forget her name. But anyway, um, 
it starts off, you're on a date, you go to this opera scene, and there's opera ladies singing, and everybody bursts into flames except you. You go out and you find out that this Eve singer is like a evolution of this parasite that they called Eve. Uh, in Japan, it was originally was, and she moved over to here through some people you know. I forget, like your sister's involved. Very weird. Um, but it, they put a lot of thought in this story. Um, the gameplay is very... You run around these like almost like Resident Evil looking uh, backgrounds, like image backgrounds, like Final Fantasy Resident Evil. They're like JPEGs. They're more than JPEGs, but they're like images, I think. They're not 3D. And you get into random battles, and the battle system is you, you can move around to dodge attacks, and when you can attack, when your attack fills up, you can attack, and um, you attack with, like, guns, and, um, boy, I'm forgetting a lot about this game already. I remember the, la the last boss of this game was very hard, so I had to look up, excuse me, how to beat him. Um, and there was this funny part where you're with, you have this cop, you're a cop, I forgot to mention. And you go to parts of, it takes place in New York, and the funny thing about this, the last part of the game, there's this scientist that's also with you from Japan, and he wants to get, he gives you this stuff all throughout the game, like, here's a lucky charm, take it, and it's all useless stuff. And at the last part of the game, when you really need him to give you these things, he says, here, Eve, I got you these bullets, and then the, your boss, your partner, Button and says, stop giving her all this crap. She doesn't need him. And, but it's actually the bullets you need to beat the final boss. And so you're fighting the final boss and then they're in a helicopter above. And he says, oh, I need to give Eve these bullets. They're the only thing I think they can beat the boss or beat this perk guy. And he goes, why didn't you give it? That's what you wanted to give her? I thought it was like a lucky charm like you always give her. So he takes the, the bullets and he like jumps off out of the plane. <laughs> And, or the helicopter in like this CG sequence and he's like immediately like the boss has the ability to light people on fire like use their um, mitochondria and burst them into flames so he gets burst into flames and he's like on fire and he yells e or what's her name Ava I think her name is and he throws him the bullets to her and he like falls in the ocean it was like I found it really funny it was so it's just so stupid but funny um, and then he so you, you um, beat the boss, and then there's a part I died on afterwards where he's chasing you, and you have to make the right, find out where to go. So I looked up where to go on that. Um, very unique game, very, very fun in parts, but it wasn't quite, quite my cup of tea. I thought the story was kind of dumb. Um, it looked very cool and sounded great. I think the soundtrack's great. Um, I don't think I'll play this anytime soon again. I didn't really enjoy it enough to... I'm glad I played through it, though. Uh, now we're getting to some games. I uh, Some NES games here. I've got one, two, three, four, five of them. I'll start off with uh, this one here, Legacy of the Wizard. Um, my friend in, in junior high had this game, and we could never get far into it. But I remember the music, and I remember being thinking it was very, very hard. And it is very hard, but it's hard in the fact that the world is very large in this game. And you play as a family who's a the Drazzle family. Um, Drazzle family, and they're tasked with defeating the dragon that's awaking well, in a labyrinth beneath them. So there's a mother, daughter, sister, brother, and a, their pet, um, Pope, I forget his name. I want to say pokey, I don't think that's it. But you have to pick, each one of them has, can use different items and what and stuff. And you have to find out, like, the, the father can move, like, blocks with his glove hand. Um, the mother can uh, fly with a special item. The daughter can, like, jump super high. Uh, and the, the son can only, is the one that can use the sword to defeat the dragon. And the, the pet is very powerful, but and he doesn't get hurt by enemies, but his jump's pretty bad. So when you first play this game, you're going to pick, okay, I'm going to pick this person. And you'll leave, and you'll go into the dungeon. You'll fight some things. It's typical, like, uh, beat enemies. You get keys, you get gold, and you get life, hearts, um, and you'll soon get lost. 
and you say, okay, I'm going to, and you'll die and you'll go back to the beginning and you'll pick somebody else and you'll do this. And it's not until you'll probably get frustrated and I don't know where to go. But if you stick with it, and I would say look at it, look at, look at, um, read the instructions online and look at some recommended, like, suggestions for it. It's, it becomes a very fun and rewarding game. Um, it's almost like a Metroid game, exploration type game, but it's very vague sometimes on where you gotta go. And that can be a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing is just stumbling into an area you're not supposed to and figuring out, okay, I have to use this person to get here. Um, I wouldn't say it's too... Once you learn how to game plays I didn't get stuck in it too much I had to look up where to go once, three times once with pokey there was a certain area I had to jump up and break a block to progress to get to the first crown and once with the mother to find an item and then once it, to find where the last boss was other than that I got through the game just by reading the instructions and reading some tips online um, I highly recommend this game if you have the time. It's very good. Um, very challenging. Um, but it's very rewarding to get through the game and see the ending. And the music done by Yuzo Koshiro is outstanding. Um, it's an earlier work of him. This is by Falcom, who did Ease um, series. This is in, in the um, Dragon Slayer list of games. This was one of... Like, I think the only one or two of them we got translated over here. This is actually Dragon Slayer 4. Uh, um, and the family you play as is called Drassil. It's like an anagram or mixed up letters for Dragon Slayer. Um, you have to get a crown. There's four crowns. And once you get the crowns, you have to find which painting to go into to get to a certain area to get the sword. And the sword is used by the brother, the son, who can defeat the dragon, and then you win the game. So, each each uh, each family member gets a crown, and you get warped to the, you find a crown, you get warped to the boss, you beat the boss, you get a crown, you go back. And you do that four times, and then you have to find out where to, like I said, get the sword, and then you fight the boss. Um, it, it's just, I was blown away by it. This game is very good. Um, it's very frustrating if you don't know where to go, um, but it's just look up where to go. Um, it's worth playing, I think, if you can ever play this. Um, play it until you get stuck. Look up where to go. There's no harm in that. And um, play it again until you get stuck and look up where to go. But I think if you play this game and learn how to play it, it it's worth playing through. I really like Legacy of the Wizard. Next up is Bionic Commando. I've tried to play this game a lot, and I've always got um, confused of where to go, what to do. Um, but I, I, I finally wanted to beat it. Um, I'm surprised how it wasn't too long once I learned what to do. And the manual is not very good at helping you. Um, I think they give you a map here. But, and, but the map is basically the same one in the game. They give you like a menu picture, they give you the controls, but I think the controls are wrong. They say that um, <clears throat> they say that A is like your weapon, and I think it's like, uh, I think, it, or A is your arm, um, but I think it's like reversed. I think that the controls in here are reversed. Um, they don't tell you a lot about what to do in a manual, so I had to really learn how to play this game. And I didn't know there were continues in this game until I read it in the overhead sections. When it, you run into a, your copter on the map, runs into a truck, you can beat special enemies in there to give you continues. So you can farm continues, and the game becomes much more easier, much more playable after that. Um, because you're going to die a lot until you get used to the, the controls, which are you can't jump, you have to use a hook. And you swing, and you grapple up, grapple up the platforms. That's how you move around. So you're stuck to the ground. And your only option is to use the hook of your arm. I think B is your hook button. So it becomes very, very. There was one section in the game where I wasted most of my lives. You had to swing on these little like lights, and you had to time it just right. I must have died like, tw like 
10, 15, 20 times there until I got used to it. And that's where I usually put it down because I didn't know you get continues. Um, once I figured out you got continues, you can, and I figured, I found a nice spot. When you beat enemies, they drop little bullets. And the bullets actually, they are like experience points. And when you get so many, you can get finally up to 300, you can get up to like 8 or 9 life bars. So when you get so many, you level up, you can get a bigger life bar. It starts out with one hit and you're dead, but there's a level in this elevator part in the first stage where enemies parachute in. You can get to an area and where you can farm them. And I just stayed there for about half an hour, 45 minutes until I maxed out my life bar. And that made the game a lot easier with the continues. And then I could practice and get used to the grappling and I didn't die as much. Um, but the game is very fun. I'm very, after that, um, you learn how to grapple and you learn that the continues are there. Um, makes the game much more easier. Um, the last boss, basically the story, it's weird. It's like they want to, uh, this, the bads they're called want to resurrect or they want to take over. And there's this guy, Generalissimo, he wants to take over. Uh, I thought he was going to resurrect, like, Dr. D or Master D, who is basically Hitler, looks like Hitler, but at the end he like destroys Master D, like in a tank, and then something happens, Master D actually does come back to life, and he's in this like big helicopter, so you fight the helicopter by swinging on these up to this, its weak point and shooting it, and then you meet, I forget his name, and he gives you the bazooka, and then you, another weapon, and he says, jump down, and as you fall down, shoot right into the cockpit and take out Master D. So you have to jump down, You fall as you're falling, you have to time your shot to go through the cockpit, and then the famous picture of, when you do, you see in a few panels of Hitler, his face, Master D, Hitler, his face exploding. Um, so that was kind of cool. But I've seen it already uh, it, on in the internet, cause I, so it was kind of spoiled, but it was cool to see actually beat the game, but... The main joy of this game is, um, uh, for me, after I found out, okay, I have unlimited chances to beat this game, I don't have to worry about dying, I can really mess around with by grappling around and having fun and learning the stages. Because um, the stages aren't really long, but it's finding out where, how to use your hook to move around. It makes it very enjoyable. Not a long game, but um, once I did figure out how to do it. But, you know, very fun game after that. But get the continues on the overhead screens, map screens, and farm your life on the first stage, and you can get through Bionic Commando fairly easily. Next up is Vice Project Doom. Uh, this is by Amer American Sammy, I forget, or they published it, I forget who developed it. Um, but the cover art is, I remember the cover art, this was on a, I think a Nintendo Power I had, where there was a pair of binoculars in it, on the cover, but they covered Vice Project Doom. It was a late NES game. Super Nintendo was coming out, or was out. Um, but this place is, um, you start off on like a top-down racing shooter stage, and then you go to a side-scrolling Batman Ninja Gaiden kind of game, and you have like a sword, a lightsaber thing, an energy sword something, you slash with it as a wide arc, so it'll take care of enemies above and anything in that arc. And you hit select button, you have like a gun with limited ammo, and you hit select again, you have an arcing grenade. And each one of those can take out, use those to take out enemies in certain locations and bosses as well. I found the bosses are best to just get close to them and spam the slash button to take them out really quickly. Um, the last boss you have to use grenades on to beat. That took me a little bit to figure out. Um, there are cutscenes like Ninja Gaiden. Um, uh, and then there's like zapper stages like Bayou Billy, but you don't use the zapper. You use the controller to move a target around to shoot enemies. Um, and it's not, you get unlimited continues, so it's not, you can beat it if you just put the time into it. Um, I beat it my first time playing through, uh, but I used a lot of continues because I had to learn the stages and patterns. Uh, it's very forgiving, and it's very, there's a lot of stages, but they move by very quickly, like Ninja Game. It's like 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. Uh, there's like, I want to say 12 stages or more, um, but they move for, very quickly. There's like driving stages, there's like a shooting stage. Um, very fun game. And it's also on the Switch if you have Nintendo Online for the Nintendo Switch. Uh, it's one of the NES games they released on there. It's worth playing.
and you can get through it because there's unlimited continues. Any game with unlimited continues, I love. I know I can beat if I just leave the system on and come back to it. I can pick up right where I'm off, and I'll be fine. Uh, another game is Arkista's Ring. Uh, this is a top-down action game. Uh, think Gauntlet, but not not um, that long. Or it's long, but as you want it to be. But it's not... You have, like, RPG elements where involving random drops. So you start as this girl... These people of the elven village, they steal the ring, and she says, I'm going to get the ring back. So she goes on a quest, and it's kind of cool. You go through the area, you go through woods, and it kind of like maps through these areas. Um, you get items. You start off with a small life bar, and you beat items. They, you beat enemies, and they drop random items. So the items aren't anywhere specific. They just drop randomly. So depending on where you play, you could get lucky and max out your life bar really early. Um... And you max out your life bar by getting armor pieces to add onto it. So you get like a helmet, shield, armor. And you start off with like three item slots. And you can get more by getting item pouches that enemies drop randomly. So you can get like a lot more. So you want to max out those as soon as possible to make the game easier. Uh, it's not overly difficult until you get to the final stages where you fight ninjas. And that becomes really hard unless you have these little ninja stopping items to stop them in their tracks. So you have to go basically each screen and you have to beat the enemies and get a key. Get the key to go to the next area. Almost like low low but not as puzzly. Um, there's also random staircases that you can go onto but don't take you anywhere and they'll trigger an enemy and then you got to find the right one. And um, the last part of this game so there's 32 levels. You beat I beat the game my first time through. You get like Three or four, no, eight continues, um, and I think five, three or four lives, I think, I forget, but you go through 32 stages, you beat the final boss, and you get the ring, and you beat the game, but then it loops, and it goes to stage third, and all the stages are the same again, but they rename them, instead of 1 to 32, it's 33 to 64, and I think it loops uh, four times? And each time the enemies get faster, I read, and harder. Um, so I went through on the second playthrough, trying to beat it. And I got up to the second to last stage, but the ninjas, you have to make sure you have the right items. It's very luck-based. You have to have the right items to slow down and stop the ninjas to beat them. And that stage in particular, you have to find out the right staircase to step on to go to the last boss. If you don't step on the right one, it'll spawn another ninja. And... You'll soon run out of items or, and die. And these ninjas will kill you very, very quick. They just jump on top of you. They're faster than you. They can jump over walls, and they will drain your life in an instant. Um, so I quickly, I think I got there. I had, like, used one continue. I had, like, full health, full lives. But I didn't have the ninja stoppers. And because of that, I died and lost all my continues. Um, so, but, so I didn't beat it through the four loops. I beat it once through, and that's good enough. And after I was done, I kind of wanted to play it again. Um, it's very simple and random, but it's very fun. Um, and you have a bow and arrow you shoot, I should say. And you can upgrade your bow and arrow by enemy drops again, but they don't tell you that. You have, at, at the end of the stage, before between stages you get select, it'll tell you your inventory, like select your stats of what bow and arrow you have. That's the only way you know. Uh, next up. We have the magic of Shirasade, I think it is. Um, I remember, um, besides not saying the name, I remember seeing this game. On, it, I remember that on the cover and just wondering how you say that. Um, this is a, one of the more unique NES games I've played. Um, it's a Middle Eastern RPG that has top-down battles, but also mixes up Dragon Warrior turn-based battles in between. Um, you time travel in it, and through doors, of, so you go back to the past of these different areas to go meet people and affect the present, and you find these characters that fight with you that are like from... Middle East war. Um, there's like 
or six, eight of them, I think, six of them, seven of them, and they'll fight with you on the random battles. So the top-down battles are very much like Legend of Zelda, Secret of Mana, very simplified where you just slash with your um, sword. You have three classes you can pick at an inn or a mosque at any time. A mosque is where you to save your game. You have a fighter, which has a longer sword, more powerful with the sword. A magician, who I loved, which had a rain, his um, magical attacks with a rod were more powerful. And a mage, or a um, holy man, I forget what they call him. He's like a paladin, but I didn't like him at all. He was not good with the sword or the wand. Um, he was... So I use, I only used him on an area of the story that I need to progress. But all of them can use swords, wands, but depending on the, if you choose the fighter or the wizard, they're better with the sword or the wand. And the paladin isn't good with either of them. But the paladin can use a shield, which, if you stand still, will block enemies' attacks. So you go through these overhead sections. You go to towns, you talk to people, you find out where to go. And then at a point you have to go through a time door to go back in time to find people to get your allies and to advance the story and beat a boss. Um, and the allies help you on the boss. So when you the turn-based battles are you see the enemy and you have a list of your moves. You have to well this is it's weird to explain. It's like a turn-based dragon quest battle, but it's more advanced in that not advanced, but there's more to it where when you first start, you can run away, fight, or you can select formation. Formation is like different. Oh, how can I explain this? Different. When you get more allies, they're against certain enemies. If you do a formation, they'll call it a formation. And these are very effective against those enemies. So you have to learn what enemies to use what formation on. So it's very, very cool in that effect, but it's hard to remember what's good on what. So I ran away on a lot of them. Um, but if you look it up, I looked up my main facts of what they tell you, but you should write it down. I didn't write it down, so I looked up what formation is good against certain enemies. Um, and then you can buy extra troops up to four of them will fight with you, but you can buy a stockpile of up to 99 of them, and they'll just attack. So you, they fight with you, and you can attack and use spells. It's very cool. I never saw anything like that. I kind of wish they would have stuck with just one or the other, though. Um, but it's neat that they mixed and matched them. Um, a very unique game. Um, I don't think I'll play it again ever, but I'm f glad to go through it. Um, uh, I was always curious about it. So that's M Magic of Shirazade. The last game I beat, I just beat this today. Uh, that's Fantasy Star on the Master System. Um, I, I beat Fantasy Star 4 this year, and I love that game. And I, this one is, I wanted to play, I, I read that the dungeons are like first person, but it's very unique. One of the earlier RPGs to come out. Um, and it, um, I always wanted to play it, so I picked it up. And very grindy at the beginning. Um, but it gets easier as you get along, much like other RPGs. Um, you start out, your brother dies, he's, he says, beat Lassic, take this plot, find Odin, and beat Lassic. So that's all you got to go on. You leave, leave the area, and the enemies can wipe you out instantly, so you have to take time grinding to get a few levels, get gear, upgrade your gear, but better gear. Then you have to find the passport, to go to the planet, to get uh, Mew, who's a who's a uh, cat that follows with you. He's your second party member. Then you get Mew. He has the medicine. He says Odin's been turned to stone. So you go to the Medusa cave. You find Odin. You use the medicine. You get your third party member, Odin. He's like the main warrior. And you can use guns or axes. The guns are majority of what you want to use. Um, and then after that, you have to go to the other planet, um, the desert planet, and you find your fourth and final party member, uh, Noah. He's a magician, uh, who's actually in, after be playing Fantasy Star 4, it was cool to see the origin of these characters. Noah was in Final Fan Fantasy Star 1, and he's also in Fantasy Star 4. So it's cool to see him. And then the parts in 
Alice is the main character, and she has a statue of her in Fantasy Star 4, and lots of throwbacks, which is cool. Um, the graphics are very colorful and nice. The battle enemies in particular are very cool. Uh, the dungeons are all, like, I was surprised how smooth scrolling and how cool the walls looked. They looked very cool. Um, I mapped out one, two dungeons, one full one, the first one, and the second one I mapped out started to, and I got... It was taking too long, so for the rest of the dungeons in the game, I just looked up maps. Because um, that's the main challenge of this game. I'm grinding and stuff I have no problem with. Um, I thought, okay, I'm going to map this whole game out. I did one or one and a half, and I thought, this is going to take me forever. Um, so I just looked up maps. And the challenge in this game is mapping out the dungeons. You'll get a completely different experience. I was enjoying the game more in the early part, mapping out the dungeons, but to a point. I didn't want to sit there and map out everything, so, like I said, I looked up um, uh, the dungeons to map out. The Switch version that came out, uh, the Sega Ages version, has auto-mapping, and the map's always on the right side of your screen. As you walk over the tiles, it'll map for you, so you don't have to map out your stuff, which is a huge help. Um, playing it that way, I recommend unless you want to take the time to map out all the dungeons or play this and just use, do what I did and look at the map on the screen and find out where to go. Because some of the later maps, the dungeons in this game get very complex and you'll be mapping out for a long time. Um, but the music is very good. Some of the music that came, I remember from Fantasy Star 4 because it originated here. Um, I love the combat. I, I did like, even though the characters didn't have a lot of development, mostly Alice, I did like the characters. Uh, Mew, especially the cat, he turns into this dragon and takes you to the final power in the game. Um, that was cool and unexpected. Um, you can talk to enemies on the screen, and like you can talk to these spiders and they'll tell you tips. You can talk to, like, I beat these like little Jawa-looking guys, which on Fantasy Star 4, I remember seeing them. They were uh, Desi Desites. Um, no, Mo Movavians. Uh, they were like in the desert. They look like Jawas, very much stuff like Star Trek, um, the Star Wars. But they'll tell you tips. But I ended up slaughtering a lot of them because um, they get good gold. Um, nothing. It's not bad if you do that. It's just I didn't figure out until later they'll tell you tips. But the tips aren't really. I only did one or two. Um, and you have space travel, much like Fantasy Star Four. But there's originally in here you go to a spaceport. There's like a, you get a. At the beginning of the game, I had to figure out where do I go, and I figured, okay, I need to get this passport to get through, or you have to get a road pass to get a passport to get to the airport to go to see the governor, and when you meet the governor, you have this flashback and this battle where you're fighting this phase guy, which I he was in the Fantasy Star 4 as well, and it's like a flashback, to what's or a flash forward to what's going to happen. Um, I don't want to say any more, but it took me a while. It took me... One, two, three, one, two, three, four long play sessions to beat this of eight hours, I think, or six, seven, eight hours. Um, but the music and graphics are very, very good. This was a very early game, 1988. Um, yeah, and I'm glad I finally beat it. Yeah, woo, that's everything I beat for April of 2020. Hope you have a great day and great rest of your week and great month of May. Take care. Bye.